The following is a production of the University of Minnesota. So today we have Professor Silas and Professor Mihailo, and I think you can introduce yourself. He's a professor at the University of Minnesota, and I'm doing a course under him this sem, and it's been going good so far. And so it's over to you. Thank you. I didn't exercise this much in years, actually. It's scary. So it seems that popularity of wind energy course is dropping. Last year we had actually around 60, 70 students, and now Mudita tells me that there are as many enrolled, but apparently based, judging just based on how many of you are here, it's not as popular as it used to be. Okay, so I need to tell you a little bit about feedback control. So let me see what's going on here. Oh, this is Mac. This may not be working, actually. OK. Good. OK, so we, we split this into two parts. I'm going to give you a very brief introduction into basic ideas between, behind feedback control. And then Professor Seiler is going to tell you how feedback control is utilized in the context of wind energy research. So just, just out of curiosity, how many of you have taken controls course in the past? OK. So for many of you, this is actually going to be then a very boring overview of the things that you are already familiar with, and at least in the first 45 minutes. But however, for the rest of you, I need to make sure that you get at least the basic idea behind feedback control. So here is a brief outline of our talk. talk and as I mentioned, introduction to feedback control is going to be uh, presented by me and Professor Seiler is going to tell you about modeling control and fault detection in the context of wind turbine research and he's also going to highlight some of the future research challenges that we are facing in this area. So here is a brief outline of what I want to tell you. I want to present the idea of feedback to contrast closed loop systems, systems that use feedback in order to form corrective action versus open loop policies to talk a little bit about block diagrams, a very useful abstraction for dealing with feedback systems and to briefly summarize current state of, the, of knowledge in this area. So here is the basic idea behind feedback. So what do you want to do? You want to form corrective action based on the measurements that come to you, that become available to you, that are at your disposal. And the way you do this is by comparing reality, the actual results, with the desired results, right? And then based on the difference, you form cor corrective action, right? All of you are taking courses. You want to get A to excel in your courses, right? That's your desired result. You compare your performance relative to where you stand at a certain point in your course, and based on that, you decide how much effort you should put in terms of hours that you devote to, you should devote to studying a certain topic. Right? On the other hand, if you take a look at what open loop control does, you choose your action from the outset and you don't change anything, no matter what reality is. You have decided to study 15 minutes per week for a certain class and you're going to spend 15 minutes no matter whether your performance is at the A level or failing level. Right? So this is the basic difference between two approaches. Feedback is also called closed loop control, as I mentioned. So I don't know where I should stand. Let me move there, perhaps, so that people on this side see what is going on. And maybe I'll be switching back and forth between two positions. Right? Let me give you a very simple example that is going to highlight the difference here. So we are going to take a look at the model, which is simple static model. Think of a, a resistor in a in electrical engineering context, or a simple lever in mechanical engineering context, right? This is a model. U is an input control input that I'm going to apply. Y is a corresponding output that I'm going to obtain. And then imagine that there is a disturbance that is trying to compromise results that I want to achieve, right? So there are three signals here, Y, 
is the output, right? How much this lever is going to move when I push it in one direction. D is disturbance, right? Something that is outside of my control. Let's say how how uh, how much you know weight I have on this end of a lever, for example. And U is corresponding control that I'm applying. How much I'm going to push lever, right? And then open loop control would be to form core to form my action based on the desired outcome that I would like to achieve. This R here is a reference signal, contains perhaps information how much I would like this lever to be pushed in one direction, right? And I would like my control to be proportional to the desired result. And if you substitute the second equation into the first equation, you're going to end up with the following algebraic expression here. And imagine that your objective is that the output is equal to the reference signal that you exactly achieve, you know, by that you exactly achieve reference signal at this right end, right? If disturbance is equal to zero, can you tell me how you could choose KC in order to make sure that Y is equal to R? What do you need to do with KC? Hmm? Y is equal KP times Kc times R. Let's think of what this Kp is. Kp is a model of our system, right? In this concrete case, it tells me location of this support for my lever, right? As I start moving this support along the lever, Kp is going to change, but assume that this is fixed. This is something that I obtained from modeling my physical system. Kc is something that I want to determine, and the question that I'm asking you, if you know Kp, how should you select Kc so that Y is equal to R? And this is not a tricky question, so you don't, there is no reason for you to call your friends to help you, right? To go on Facebook and to ask them, hey, save me here. So this is what I'm asking you. If Kp is given to you, you know that Kp is 2, how should you choose Kc so that Y is equal to R? One half. Right? Kp times Kc better be equal to 1. Right? If you choose, if you know exactly Kp and you choose Kc to be 1 over Kp, you're going to have that y is equal to r. You're going to achieve reference behavior. But the problem is that you don't have any way of compensating for the presence of this disturbance here. Right? You're not using information about disturbance. In the absence of disturbances, and in the case when you know your model perfectly, you're going to be able to achieve reference behavior, but the presence of this disturbance is going to compromise quality of your response, and also uncertainty that you may have in your model may also compromise your ability to achieve desired behavior. And the best way for us to go around this is to use feedback. Right? Feedback has two parts here. It has information about the reference signal, something that I would like to achieve. I measure the output, y. I'm comparing the actual output to the desired output, and I'm applying certain gain in front of it. Right? Now, I need to combine this equation with the original equation, and if I combine two of them, the equation that I end up with is given here. And let's see what is going to happen here. Let's do a very simple analysis. If you take a look at how references are mapping in, mapped into outputs, it turns out that the relationship is given here, right? And think of a simple setup where, let's say, Kp times Kc is large. If somehow I manage to make product of these two numbers big, right? Large plus one is roughly equal to large. Kp divided by Kp times Kc divided by Kp times Kc is roughly equal to 1. Right? So if I choose Kc to be large, much bigger, let's say, than Kp, I could achieve roughly, I could make my output to be roughly equal to the reference signal. We need to examine what is going to happen with disturbances, though. Take a look at what is going to happen here if Kp times Kc is very big, one is going to become negligible to this. So the ratio of Kp divided by Kp times Kc is roughly going to be equal to one divided by Kc. For large enough Kc, disturbance is going to have smaller and smaller influence on my response. Right? 
Even though I didn't have any information about this disturbance, just by picking this KC to be large enough, I managed to, roughly speaking, reject the influence of disturbances on my output and to make my input to follow the desired output. Uh, make my output to follow the desired input, right? Obviously, you need to consider dynamics. You need to consider noise, measurement noise that is present in your system. There are many additional things that you should be paying attention to. But this gives you a broad, rough idea, essentially, what feedback allows you to do, right? It allows you to achieve desired response even in the presence of uncertainties, you should be paying also attention to the dynamics. Why? Because you may destabilize nominally stable system by introducing feedback, make it explode even, even though original system was stable on its own, right? But there are the list of benefits outweighs these risks significantly. The list of benefits is given here, reduces effect of process disturbances of the signal D that I mentioned, makes system insensitive to process variations, to part of the system that I don't know, to the fact that KP is not known exactly. It can stabilize an unstable system, and also it creates well-defined relationships between signals, right? But you can destabilize system, nominally stable system, if you don't do careful, feedback design, control design, and you may also amplify noise. You're going to introduce noise into your problem. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to give you a few examples that come from different areas, from electrical engineering, aerospace engineering, and broadly speaking, mechanical engineering. Cruise control for, let's say, control of cars, vehicles, right? And I hope that these examples are going to send a major message across as to what is feedback control all about. If you take a look at the negative feedback amplifier, the schematic is given here. It's a device that was invented almost 100 years ago, and it was a revolutionary development in a sense that it allowed, actually, uh, for correction of instabilities and distortion in amplification of communication signals by, by uh, uh, virtue of the negative feedback. So what do you do here? Rather than trying to achieve, you know, uh, to, to follow references in the open loop fashion, we are going to measure the output of our system, this voltage V2, and we are going to bring it back through a negative feedback. And if you do the algebra, if you do elementary op-amp analysis, it turns out that the relationship between output signal, this voltage V2, and the input signal, voltage V1, is roughly given by this relationship here. Right? So what is the problem? The problem is that this operational amplifier has non-trivial uh, dynamics here, and you know it, it's built out of unreliable components, but what we know for sure is that the gain that operational amplifier creates is very large, right? even though it can vary from, let's say, 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 8th, we know that this is a large number, right? This is the only thing that we know about it, right? And then what I would like to argue here is if A is large enough, right, 1 over A is going to be small, right? And if you take a look at what is going on here, 1 plus some small number is roughly going to be equal to 1. So you see that input-output relationship even for unknown values of A, but large values of A, is roughly given by a ratio of these two resistors. Right? It's purely determined by passive components. Right? So just by virtue of the fact that we measured this output signal and we passed it back to the input point here, we managed to obtain well-defined relationship between inputs and outputs in spite of uncertain components that we are dealing with, right? So, and then, obviously, if you want V2 to be equal to V1 with a negative side, you only need to choose that R2 is equal to R1, right? And you can do that. You can buy components, actually, that are going to allow you to do this, right? So this is the very first example. Gains are determined only by passive components. Another example is coming from aerospace engineering, where there are two design configurations. They differ based on the position of the center of mass and center of pressure. 
One of them is a stable configuration, another one is unstable configuration, but this unstable configuration has advantage in terms of uh, ability to execute sharp maneuvers. Right? You would like actually to intentionally build unstable aircraft in order to enhance ability of your aircraft to achieve sharp turns. Right? The problem with the second configuration is that it is unstable in order to avoid aircraft falling down in a miserable fashion, you need to use feedback control, right? And if you use feedback control, you can stabilize your aircraft during flight and actually make this unstable configuration work to your advantage. And this is typically used, obviously, in, in civil applications. You're not going to use this, but in, in military applications, maneuverability is an important aspect. So you, you may want, actually, to think of doing something like this. And here is the example that probably many of you are very well familiar with. It's given by cruise control in vehicles, right? This is the user interface that you can see, right? I mean, you, you turn cruise control on when you're driving at 65 miles per hour, and hopefully it should be able to keep it at that level, right, in spite of road variations or change in slope or potholes that you encounter along the way and other things, right? And the key question is how is something like this designed, right? So here is a story about block diagrams. I don't know how much I should go through this. I mean, this is really just to tell you that block diagrams allow you to represent systems that come from very different physical origins in a un unified fashion in a sense, to highlight the flow of information in your system and to, to hide details about physical aspect, right? I mean, it's, let's not worry too, too much about this, right? But it's going to become clear, actually, when I start applying this idea to the context of cruise control, right? So what would you do in the open loop? In the open loop, you determine the relationship between, let's say, po position of your gas pedal position of the engine throttle, if you want to, and velocity, right? You know that if you're driving on a straight road, if you move your throttle by a certain amount, you're going to go at a certain speed. The problem with this approach would be once you encounter disturbances, right? What is going to happen when instead of driving on your own, you drive a football team, right, with some offensive linemen being in the back of your car, Right? Perhaps you should open the throttle a little bit more in order to be able to go at 65 miles per hour. And what is going to happen if you have disturbances, for example, slope of the road? Right? Rather than driving on perfectly flat road, you start changing the slope of the road a little bit, and still you would like to go at 65 miles per hour in spite of that. Right? So essentially what I told you here is summarized under these several items, right? Car is the object that you would like to control, physical system that you would like to control. You would like to achieve certain velocity, and your input is the throttle command. How much should you open your engine in order to achieve desired velocity, right? And controller is a, essentially a device that is going to allow you to achieve this, provided that you have information about desired velocity and in the feedback setup, also information about current velocity of your vehicle. Okay? And this is exactly what is highlighted on this slide here. So essentially, in the feedback context, what you are doing, you are comparing desired action, desired velocity, 65 miles per hour, with the real velocity, actual velocity whatever you have at a certain moment, you form the error signal, and then your controller is going to tell your throttle whether it should get more opened or more closed in order to force car to go at certain speed. Right? And I'm sure that you've noticed this, you know, when you're driving, if you all of a sudden start going on, on road that experiences slight, uh, slightly bigger incline, right? What would happen? What would your uh, gas pedal do, right? It would get moved to a position, pushed further down, so that throttle is opened more so that you get closer to achieving this velocity, right? Okay, and here is, you know, more detailed representation where 
you know, in addition to this controller that we, we are going to discuss in the moment, we represent engine of our car as an actuator as well, right? So let's move gradually through this block diagram, the symbolic representation of our system, and see what different components, how different components in this block, block diagram look like, right? The desired velocity is set on this dashboard, right, on your, on your wheel. Essentially, if you move at 65 miles per hour and you press this button on, this device is going to remember that you press this on button, and from now on, the desired command is to go at 65 miles per hour, right? If you take a look at what this controller is, it's a device, embedded processor, that executes algorithm that is going to tell throttle to get more open or more closed, right? If you take a look at what car is, right? Ideally, all of us should drive something like this, right? system that we want to control, and I wouldn't mind controlling something like this, right? Actuator, it's the engine, right? And then sensor is, uh, you know, the speed, odometer essentially, speedometer that tells me what the current speed of the wheel is, right? When I collect information about this, I'm going to form my correcting action based on the error signal based on information how much I deviate from where I would like to be, essentially, right? And what are disturbances? Members of the football team would be disturbances, or if you're moving, that may be disturbance as well. And another disturbance may be slope of the road or potholes that you're experiencing in springtime after, uh, you know, snow season is over in Minnesota, right? These may be disturbances. You should think of disturbances as things that we don't have any control over. Obviously, I could decide who I'm going to drive in my vehicle, right? But if I want to get to a certain point where I need to use a road with a bigger slope, I cannot avoid that, right? So these are exogenous things that are not under my control, right? So what do we want to do? We want to maintain the desired velocity, let's say constant velocity, 65 miles per hour. And what are design considerations that you need to pay attention to, right? Quality of the transient response, how quickly I'm going to achieve this after disturbances start hitting me. Let's say that's one, one measure of the transient response, rise time or overshoot, how much I'm going to deviate from where I would like to be, right? Changes in the desired velocity, how should I change these things, right? Driver's comfort or passenger's comfort, right? You don't want, you know, to, to form um, abrupt actions that are going to compromise quality of drivers or passengers. And then all the things that are not under my control, disturbances, modeling uncertainty, the fact that I don't know exact model of all of these things that appear in my system, and also inevitable sensor noise. Right. We need to pay attention to all of these things in order to be able to, to design controller that is somehow going to strike a balance between these perhaps competing approaches, right? Okay, so how do we do this? The very first thing in any control design is modeling of the system, right? We need to have some idea, perhaps rough idea, of what my system is going to be doing. I don't need to know exact model of my system, but I, know, I need to know at least conceptually what's going on, right? So how would you model car? What would be a good model of a car? Hmm? What would be the very first thing that you would uh, use as an approximation of dynamics of the car? So what is a car? It's a moving mass, right? It's a moving mass. This throttle is applying some force to my moving mass, right? So what law should I use to relate force that engine is applying on my car to position and velocity of the car? MA equals F, right? Second Newton's law, right? 
I mean, acceleration is equal to, to force. Okay? That's what you should use. That would be the simplest version of the model for our system. And since, since we don't care about position, we are just going to write the fact that mass times derivative of velocity is equal to force. I only care about velocity. Right? So this would be the model of my, a very simple model of my vehicle, right? Then you design controller, right? This so-called PID, proportional integral derivative control is the basic approach. There are more advanced techniques, but this works surprisingly well in many, many different contexts, right? Then you go and you essentially study how your controller performs on perhaps simplified model of your system. Right? You go to MATLAB and you simulate, and then when you have enough confidence that this is working reasonably well, you go and you implement your controller on, on the real system. Right? And then you may iterate between different stages here. Right? You may iterate even after the stage one, if it turns out you know, that this is not a very good model of your system, after you design controller and perhaps plug it into more reliable model, it turns out the discrepancy is big, you may ask the question, shall I go to step one and modify the model of my system, or shall I design another controller, and so on. So every control design is an iterative process. It's not a one-shot technique. Very often when we teach these courses, we give you certain techniques, and we say, okay, design controller to achieve something, but it's very rare that in real life you do this in one shot. You would usually iterate between uh, modeling steps, control design step, and then validation and verification steps before you actually hook it up to the real system and certify that your controller is going to, to work well. Okay? So, here is the cornerstone of classical control, if I may say so. It's so-called PID controller, or proportional integral derivative controller. So, as the name says, there are three parts here. And they tell you how you process discrepancies between desired behavior and actual behavior. This E of T is the error signal. In the proportional context, you multiply the current error with this proportional gain Kp. Right? If my think of it this way here, right? This is the history of your error. This is desired velocity that you would like to achieve, and this is the current time present time, right? If my velocity here is smaller than the desired velocity, what should I do if I'm using only proportional action? Should I open throttle? Should I push gas pedal down or should I release the gas pedal? I should push it down, right? And this is telling me push it down with a certain gain. If this gain is bigger, I'm going to push it more down according to the current value of the error. If this gain is smaller, I'm going to push it down a little bit smaller. But I'm forming my control action only using instantaneous value of the error. Right? And then there is this other component, which is integral component, which is taking into account entire history of the error signal. You compute the error signal, and then you integrate from initial time. And here we have two different velocities. We wanted to go, let's say, from 55 to 65. But let's say just focus on, on this, you know, latter part, right? So you would integrate essentially entire history of the error, right? So this is using information about entire past performance. And this has some very significant consequences, as you would see in a moment once you introduce this integral term, this is going to allow you to track constant disturbances, track constant references without making any steady state error and also to reject constant disturbances. Okay? So this term here is fundamental for our ability to be able actually to make asymptotically, as time goes to infinity, the discrepancy between desired signal and the real signal go to zero. Right? And there is this last part, which is derivative action, the way you should think of this is as a very simple predictor 
of what is going to happen on a short horizon in the future. Right? Because if you take a look at how you can approximate derivative, right, the definition of a derivative, right, the definition of the derivative is right, derivative definition is limit of let's say e of t plus delta t minus e of t divided by delta t as this delta t goes to zero, right? I forgot, forget about this limit here and I approximate derivative with this roughly, right? If I approximate derivative with this roughly, it tells you that, you know, this differential action essentially has ability to predict what is going to happen in a very primitive way one step forward in the future, on a very short horizon. There are very more sophisticated ways of, of doing this. Okay, so let's take a look at this, you know, amazing property of, you know, it's seasonal political campaign, so we need to oversell whatever we are doing. Amazing property of integral action, right? If you take a look at, if, if you have only integral action in your problem, right? And imagine that there is a steady state. That somehow, you're at, after a certain time, this t is probably going to be very large, you achieve error which is constant, and also you don't need to apply, you don't need to change control anymore. Right? There is a steady state where I'm keeping position on my throttle fixed, and I'm cruising it at a constant speed. Right? The question is what this constant speed is going to be. And the fact is, very simple algebra, I'm not going to bother you with this, very simple algebra can be used to show that steady state error has to be equal to zero. That you cannot achieve steady state with integral action unless you're exactly following the desired constant velocity, right? And this is the important property of integral action that tells you essentially that, you know, if there is a steady state error, then the steady state, uh, if there is a steady state, then the steady state error has to be equal to zero, right? And it's a simple consequence of what we wrote here. So if you take a look at what is happening here, right, I have reached, right, at, at time capital T, I have reached position on the throttle that I'm not going to chain, be changing anymore, right? That's the assumption that we made there. And this error is going to be constant. Right? So if you take a look at what is going on here, just by comparing value of the control, which I assume that is not going to be changed into this right-hand side, you see that the only way for this to hold is if the steady state error E0 is equal to zero. Right? Again, this is a big assumption that there is a steady state. You need to make sure that you design your controller so that you bring your system to the steady state. But the way you should think about integral action is it's either going to bring your system to where you want in terms of following constant references or rejecting constant disturbances, or it's going to blow up your system, in a sense. If you, in other words, if you have stability you're going to, and you have integral action in your system, you're guaranteed actually to, to have these zero steady state errors in the presence of constant references and constant disturbances. And this is a consequence of something, you know, a much broader notion of internal model principle that we teach in, in, in our controls course. Okay, there are many additional things. I'm not going to be bothering you with this. So several of you are taking my 5231 course, and there you are going to be exposed to observer-based design. You're going to see some rudiments of multi-input, multi-output design. Professor Seiler, you're going to be teaching robust control, or Gary? Gary, Professor Ballas is going to be teaching robust control course in the spring, so I strongly encourage you to take that course. It's, it's a fundamental course that allows you essentially to account for the mismatch between models and physical reality that you're using, right? The key question is, if I'm designing my controller on a model which is approximation of reality, how can I make sure that my controller is working when I hook it up to a real physical system? And there are very advanced set of tools that are by now standard and that we are teaching in robust control course, 52, 35 in the spring, nonlinear, 
you'll have a pleasure of me torturing you in the spring if you decide to take this. Adaptive, we haven't taught this in, in five years. We may at some point in the future and distribute it. I taught it last year, who knows when I'm going to teach it again. That's it. I finished in 37 minutes, which is amazing. Never happened in the past. Any questions? Any questions about anything? Confusion complete? Excellent. That's exactly what I wanted to accomplish. Thank you. We have with us Prof. Dr. Peter Stylus, and he received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in 2001. And from 2004 to 2008, Dr. Stylus worked at the Honeywell Research Labs on various aerospace and automotive applications, including the redundancy management system for the Boeing 787, sensor fusion algorithms for automotive active safety systems, and re-entry flight control laws for the NASA's Oreo vehicle. So since joining the University of Minnesota in 2008, Dr. Stylers has been working on model-based fall detection methods that can be applied for safety critical systems. He's also been investigating advanced multivariable control strategies for wind turbine control. So, all yours. Great, thank you. All right. So, I'm going to spend sort of the next or the rest of the lecture talking about more specifics about feedback control for wind turbines. And I'll give you just a little bit of overview. You may have already heard about the consortium that's at the university, just as a brief background. Then I'll really tell you about modeling, control, fault detection. And then I'll end with some sort of ongoing research. And so you've probably already heard about the turbine that was installed um, just south of campus. Um, you know already about this course. And so there's a couple of really nice things about this uh, turbine in terms of what we can do for research. So it's a 60, 60, 96 meter blade turbine. So to put that into some context, you may be aware of the Airbus A380. This is the largest aircraft ever built. It has a wingspan on the order of about 75 meters. So this diameter is, is another 50% or 33% longer than that. So these blades are, are really enormous. Um, the other nice thing about this turbine is it's, it's installed with many custom sensors that you can use for, for research, as well as there's a MET tower, which you can kind of see in the background here. All right, so what do I want to tell you about? So the main thing with wind turbine control essentially all boils down to this one equation, which you've probably seen in many lectures, which tells you how the power goes with the various parameters in the system. Okay, so the power is one half rho, which is the air density. A is the cross-sectional area of the rotor and the cube of the velocity, and then you've got the power coefficient, which is telling you how much power in the wind you're actually capturing. All right, so everything that I'm going to tell you about in terms of controls is really hidden in this CP, okay? So the first sort of three terms here are sort of the power in the wind, and then what you get to control is going to be kind of hidden in here, and that's what I need to tell you about. And so when we think about the controls, there's many things that you want to do. You want to maximize the power that you're capturing. That's the first thing I've written here. But you also want to worry about structural loads. And so here's another view of the blade. And there's a person sitting at the end here. If they tap on this blade, you'll see that it kind of flops around. It's got a lot of flexibility to it. And so if you're not careful, you can excite these blade modes. And you can cause vibrations that do structural damage. In addition, the towers are also flexible, and so if you don't do the control very well, you can excite the tower mode and cause it to oscillate back and forth. Now, the last thing that you might be concerned about is downtime. So that's going to be the fault detection part. How can you figure out that something's about to break, fix it beforehand, or fix it when it's convenient for you, so that you don't have the turbine sitting there not producing any power while it's broken? All right, so I already told you about all these things. So just as a quick review, um, I'm going to tell you a few things that we need to know for controls. So for in con controls, there's several things we get to control on a utility scale turbine. So you're already aware that as the wind passes by, it generates force on the blades, and that causes it to start to rotate. Now, the things you get to control are most modern uh, turbines have a yaw drive, so you can turn the turbine into the wind. Now, they also have um, blade pitch control, so you can generally pitch the blades. And they may or may not have individual pitch control, meaning you may be able to pitch the blades individually. And by that, I mean just rotate them about their, their root point where they attach to the hub. Um, 
The last thing you get to control is there's some power electronics on the backside on the generator, and that allows you to put a torque on the, on the shaft. And by, that, by doing that, you control uh, the rotation speed, but also the power that you're generating. And the last thing that's important is in terms of sensing. So notice here there's a little anemometer on the rear of the nacelle, and that'll be important. And the reason why it's important is it's measuring the wind speed and the wind direction. But if you notice, the wind is passing past the blades before it gets to the anemometer. And so what you're measuring is something, a, a, a measurement of the, the wind flow that's been corrupted by the blades. And so this measurement is typically, I would say, a very poor quality. And so you can use it to average over 5 or 10 minutes and get some indication of the wind speed and direction. But generally, you won't use it sort of for real-time control. And I'll make that clear as we go along. All right, so as Professor Jovanovich mentioned, the very first step in any control design is to make a, a simple model of, of the wind turbine. And so what I want to explain to you is the very simplest model that we can think about. And the very simplest model is basically, imagine first at the block diagram level. The things you get to control, as I mentioned, you get to change the pitch of the blades. You can rotate those. And you can also control the generator torque. And that governs how much power you're going to capture. And so if you did a simple block diagram, if you remember from physics, here's the rotor. I'm drawing it with two blades, but most turbines would have three blades. The rotor is rotating around with a speed omega. And you've got an aerodynamic torque. I'll say more about that in a moment. And then on the back side, you get to control this generator torque. So you get to pick this. Now, given these two things, and given the wind speed, which I'm drawing as sort of a disturbance here, you don't get to control that, those things will somehow affect the rotor speed. And there's some differential equation inside this box. Okay? So in a lot of the diagrams I'm going to draw, I'm going to just draw this box with the understanding that we get to control these two things. The wind is a disturbance. And there's some dynamics that relates that to the rotor speed. Now, the very simplest model that I could think about for this turbine dynamics is written up here. It's Newton's second law. Okay, so you already talked about the car. The translational dynamics of a car are governed by Newton's, first, or Newton's second law for translational systems. The same thing for rotational systems. This, the inertia, which includes the blades and the shaft, but it's the rotational inertia associated with the turbine, multiplied by the angular acceleration of the rotor, is given by the sum of the torques. And the torques that you have, as I mentioned, there's an aerodynamic torque, which is causing the, the shaft to rotate. And then there's a generator torque, which is slowing down this shaft. And you get to pick the generator torque. Now, this aerodynamic torque, it depends on several things. But at some very high level, you can imagine it depends on the rotational speed of the rotor, it depends on the wind speed, and it depends on the blade pitch angle. Okay? It's more complicated than that, but that's maybe the first order approximation you can make. Okay? So we'll skip ahead here. So let me tell you about this aerodynamic torque. The simple model that people would use is, I mentioned sort of on an earlier slide that there's a power coefficient. And this power coefficient is telling you what fraction of the power are you actually capturing out of the wind. And so at, at sort of the macro level or the gross level for the turbine, you might have a model that looks like the following. The, the power that you've captured in ratio to the wind, so that's sort of the relative amount of power that you've captured. That's what I'm calling CP or this power coefficient. It depends on two things. It depends on the blade pitch angle, and it depends on a non-dimensional tip speed ratio. Okay? And the tip speed ratio is literally just omega times r, which is the speed of the tip of the blade, divided by the speed of the wind. So this is a, a non-dimensional number. It has no units. And so generally what you get is a curve that looks like this. On this axis is the tip speed ratio. On this axis is the blade pitch. And on this axis is the fraction of the power that you're capturing. And so when the power coefficient is negative. That means you're actually having to drive the turbine if you want it to move at that operating condition. So we're generally more, considered in, we're more concerned about the case where the power coefficient is positive. OK, so if you start looking at this curve, you notice that there's a very well-defined peak here. And that occurs at some blade pitch angle, typically close to 0. We might call that fine pitch or the optimal pitch. And it also occurs at a certain tip speed ratio, which is generally around 5 to 7. OK? So this is sort of the power characteristics. And then the torque, I said there's an aerodynamic torque. That torque is just the power you've captured divided by omega. Right? Power is torque times angular velocity. And so if I want to write out what this aerodynamic torque is, I know that the power that I've captured is given by 1 half rho AV cubed plus this power coefficient. And then I divide by omega. And so this whole thing over here is just some nonlinear function. It depends on the wind speed, the rotor speed, and the blade pitch angle. Now, that's a very simple model, and generally people would use more complicated models than that. So just to give you some idea, 
there, there's flexible modes, as I mentioned, with the blades, the towers, the gearbox. There's also really detailed aerodynamics that you might be worried about. And these things are important in the control design. So when people are designing control laws, they generally try to use more detailed models. And a very common model that people use in the open domain is this model by NREL, which is this FAST model. FAST stands for fatigue, aerodynamics, structures, and turbulence. Okay, so it, it couples together all the aerodynamics and structures in the, the, uh, in the turbine. And it's simulating all those things at some level. Okay, so for our purposes, we'll just think about this very simple model, but you should be aware that there are much more complicated models. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit about wind turbine control. So as Professor Jovanovich mentioned, the main thing here is you try and have some idea of what you want the turbine to do. That's the reference or the desired state. You measure how the turbine is actually performing, and then based on the comparison of those two, you make some corrective action. And so there's actually several things that are going on sort of at a higher level in addition to that sort of feedback law. And so that's what I'll call supervisory control or mode logic. I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then there's various control laws that are happening. There's yaw control, and then depending on the wind speed, there are other types of control laws. And I've given a bunch of different references if you want to read more. So here's what the supervisory control law looks like. Um, when the turbine turns on, you're not imme immediately generating power. And so generally there are various states that the turbine kind of has to step through before it actually starts generating power. And this is a very simple mode logic diagram. But essentially there are four states in this simple mode logic diagram. There's an emergency state, a stop state, a pause state, and a run state. And this is a design from Will Thorson, who's in this class. And he's designing it for this turbine, which is up in near Duluth at Masabi range. But you'll find the same basic state machine on a sort of industrial scale turbine. And these states are, are the following. Let's say I was running the turbine, I was generating power, and then someone is doing maintenance inside the turbine, and then there's an emergency stop button. Something's gone horribly wrong, they press this button, Then what you want to have happen is you want the turbine to immediately transition into this emergency state, which means the blades move to some safe configuration, there's a brake that gets applied to the rotor to bring, bring the thing to a stop, and so all sorts of things happen in this emergency state. Uh, that wouldn't be sort of the normal operating sort of condition. But there are these various states, and so when you turn the turbine on, you kind of sequence your way through, and hopefully you eventually get into this run state. And in this run state, the turbine starts turning the blades, and then hopefully once the turbine starts uh, producing power at 60 hertz, you actually connect to the grid. Okay, So this high-level thing is going on, and generally what I'm going to tell you about in the rest of the class is what's going on in this run state, meaning you're actually controlling the turbine, you're actually producing power, and all these other things are special cases that are happening when you're either starting up, shutting down, or there's some sort of emergency going on. All right, so when we're in this run state, even within this run state, there are other sort of sub-states that can happen. And these sub-states depend on what the wind conditions are. And so this plot here is going to try and give you some indication of what that is. So this, the vertical axis is the power that's, that's uh, either available or being captured as a function of wind speed. And so you know that the available power, this is the actual power in the wind, it grows with the cube of the wind speed. And then the green curve is how much power you're actually capturing. And so generally there are, people might say, four regions. At really low wind speeds, so below a wind speed called cut-in, you don't do anything. You turn the turbine off because at really low wind speeds, you're not generating enough power to make it worth your while to even turn the turbine on. At really high wind speeds, you also turn the turbine off, so there's something called a cutout speed. And you turn the turbine off because out here you're worried about damaging the structure for the turbine. So if you get to a really high wind speed, you, you move the blades to a condition where they're not generating any torque, and you turn the turbine off. And so the real bulk of the operation is in between the cut-in and cut-out wind speed. And then in here, there are sort of two regions. At low wind speeds, people might call this region two, all you try and do is maximize power. So you're going to operate the turbine trying to capture as much of this available power as you can. And then at really high wind speeds, but before you get to the cutout, at that point you're not concerned about capturing more power because you're worried more about the, the structural loads. And so here you try to just capture a certain amount of power, a fixed amount of power, which would be called the rated power, and you're more concerned about reducing the loads on the turbine. So you pitch the blades and you do whatever you need to do to reduce structural loads. Um, what else do I want to say here? I didn't mention this bets limit, but I'm sure you've heard in several other classes that the fraction of the power that you can capture, there's actually a theoretical limit. 
And these, this is given by the BETS limit, which is close to 60%. So most utility scale turbines get on the order of 40% when they're operating below rated. That's nice to know. OK, so now let me tell you how these control laws actually work. There are several, several control loops that are going on on a turbine at any given time. The first control law is just the yaw control. So what I mentioned was, depending on the wind speed direction, you, move, you can move the turbine into the direction of the wind. So that's the yaw control. And there's a, a large yaw motor that will rotate the entire nacelle. And so you might think of doing something like a PID control, which is I can measure the wind speed direction, I can figure out what direction my turbine is actually facing, and then I can apply a torque to the turbine so that it yaws into the wind. Using PID or some other control law, similar to what Professor Jovanovich talked about. Now, in general, that is not what people do on a utility scale turbine. And the reason why is I mentioned that the wind speed measurements that you get are extremely noisy. OK, so you might think, well, I can measure the direction that the wind speed is coming in. But the anemometer that's being used to measure that wind speed is on the rear of the nacelle. And so it's getting very kind of disturbed or disrupted flow. And so I don't have a very good measurement of, uh, of uh, wind. And so I, that's generally not how things are done. And also there's an issue of the yaw rate is very slow. I can only turn the, the turbine at a very slow rate. And so if the wind direction is changing quickly, I can't turn the turbine quickly enough to follow the wind direction. And so a more common design is to do something like measure the wind speed for a certain amount of time in the wind direction. If in a five minute interval you notice that the wind speed is constantly coming from a direction that's different than what you're pointing in, then just move over and do this sort of um, change in direction once every five or 10 minutes. And there's a little design here by Caleb Carl Carlson, who's an undergraduate here. And so that would be a very common thing to do, which is I would call it maybe a threshold-based design. Just change your direction every once in a few minutes. Now, in terms of the, the power capture, as I mentioned, there are sort of two regions that people care about, region two and region three. And what I told you was that region two, which is at lower wind speeds but above the cut-in, what you're really trying to do is capture as much power as you can. Okay, so if we go back to this power coefficient, again, it's a function of the blade pitch and the tip speed ratio. If you want to capture as much power as you can, you want to be at the peak of this curve. And so what that indicates is you want to hold the blade pitch fixed, and then you want to hold the tip speed ratio at some value. Okay, so there's some optimal blade pitch and some optimal tip speed ratio. And so what you might think about doing is the following architecture. I've got the turbine. The wind speed is affecting it. I could hold the blade pitch constant. And what I'd really like to do is use the generator torque to make sure I get this optimal tip speed ratio. And so one way of doing that is assume I know what the optimal tip speed ratio is. If I invert the tip speed ratio relation, if you tell me the wind speed and what the desired tip speed ratio is, that will give me a certain desired rotor speed. And so I can imagine doing the following. I measure the wind speed. I figure out what the optimal tip speed ratio is to maximize power. That tells me what the desired rotor speed is. That's my reference or desired state. I measure the rotor speed of the, uh, the rotational speed of the blades. I compare that to how fast I want it to rotate. That gives me some error. And based on that error, I figure out how to change the generator torque. And this control law could be a PID or some other more advanced control law if you wanted to. And again, this is a, a certainly a reasonable idea. But you get back to this problem that we actually can't measure this wind speed very well. So because I can't measure this wind speed very well, I actually can't do this inversion of the tip speed relation to figure out how quickly I want the rotor speed to, to change. And so again, this is not something that people would typically do on a utility scale turbine. There's also another issue, this is maybe more of a side issue, which is that the optimal tip speed ratio is, is, is given by this um, power coefficient curve, this, this diagram here that I showed on the previous slide. And this curve is, is maybe uncertain. If you try to measure it, it changes based on the environment. If there's ice on the blades or if the blades have some dirt or other films on it, this curve may change a little bit. And so there's some uncertainty in the model. So instead, what people do is something called the standard control law. And so the standard control law is, again, hold the blade pitch constant at the fine pitch or optimal pitch, and then set the generator torque in this kind of weird way, which is some constant times omega squared, where this constant is given by this formula here. Okay, so this is the standard control law. It's nothing like 
I would say, anything I've seen in another control system. And so it's something very specific to wind turbines. And so the block diagram looks like this. Here's my wind turbine. The wind speed is affecting it. That's something external. I'm going to hold the blade pitch constant at the value required to get the optimal power capture. And then I'm going to set the generator torque to be k times omega squared, where omega is the measured rotor speed. Now it turns out if you do this correctly, by that I mean you pick this constant correctly, and notice that this constant depends on the rotor speed area, it depends on what the, the peak value of the, your power coefficient is, uh, what's the optimal tip speed ratio. These are all parameters from the model. If you knew these things exactly and you picked the k exactly correctly, you'd be able to show that you actually converged to the optimal power capture in steady state winds. So I've given the proof on the next slide, but I won't go through it. But there's a, there's a sort of a long, detailed proof about why this is the case. And so it's pretty interesting that this particular control law, no matter what happens in steady wind, it's going to cause you to converge directly to the peak, peak value, assuming that you knew all these parameters and the constants in, in, in your model. Okay, so I'll skip over that. Right here? Okay, so I'll just quickly go through it. Just recall that we had a simple one state model. J times the rotational ang or the angular acceleration is equal to a sum of torques. And this, ang this uh, aerodynamic torque, we said we could actually write it in terms of this power coefficient. Okay, so here's what it looks like. Now, if I assume steady winds, um, the tip speed ratio, here's the tip speed ratio, it's omega r over v. If v is constant, then the derivative of lambda, which is the tip speed, is actually just a constant times the derivative of omega dot. And so all the proof is, you just write out, if I take this generator torque, which is k omega squared, so plug in k omega squared here, you can actually write out what the dynamics are for omega dot. It's something complicated here. And now you notice that lambda is just some constant times omega. And then the proof is just, if lambda is over here, I'm going to converge in this direction. If lambda is down here, I'm going to converge in this direction. Um, so it just, it's, a, it's a matter of looking at omega dot. And so, for example, if the, the tip speed ratio is bigger than the value that gives me the maximum, if you look at what's inside this parentheses, this CP is obviously less than CP max. That's the definition of CP max. And we're assuming lambda is bigger than lambda max. So whatever is in here is actually a negative number, which means lambda, omega dot's negative, which means lambda dot's negative which means I converge up to here. And you, the, the argument on the other side is slightly more complicated, but it's basically the same sort of argument. You just look through it. And it's a clever sort of thing. And as I said, I don't think any other control system does like k omega, like a nonlinear law like this. So but have people looked at, is this used for legacy reasons? Or is there a strong it's used a reason why people should stick to it? Yeah, so this k omega squared law, um, there are several things you could think about doing for power capture, but one thing you can think about doing, first off, what's really, really nice about it is the only thing you have to measure is the rotor speed. We really don't need a measurement of, of wind speed. And so what people are trying to do now is um, people are trying to look at, well, what if I were able to measure wind speed much more accurately? I put a LIDAR on the front of the turbine, and I look at the wind flow coming in. I measure wind perfectly. Can I do much better? Well, it turns out that if I just use this k omega squared law, I get within about 3 or 4% of optimal. And so it's really hard to make an economic justification to spend $50,000 on a LIDAR when this very simple control law is very close to optimal. So I think that's what the justification is. Any other questions? Yep. This k omega squared law? That's a good question. Um, it's been in the literature, it's sort of the, there's a, in all these sorts of things, there's sometimes a split between the academic literature and the industry literature, because when people figure out things in industry, they're not very forthcoming about what they're doing. So it's not clear how long people, like if you look at Vestas or GE, how long they've been doing these things. But in the academic literature, at least 20 years, people have had this sort of law in mind. So it's got sort of a long history, which is why it's called the standard control law. It's not even attributed to anybody. It's just considered to be sort of a known trick. All right. Any other questions about this? OK, so that's the region two law. Now, if you get to higher wind speeds, I mentioned at higher wind speeds, you no longer want to try and maximize your power capture. 
because again, you're worried about the structural loads. You've only sized the components, like the power electronics, to, to generate a certain amount of power. And so then the objective is different. Instead of maximizing power, you just try and capture a certain amount of power, and then you try and reduce loads. And so in a block diagram, what it starts looking like is the following. Here's our turbine. Again, the things we get to control are blade pitch, and we get to control the, the generator torque, and the wind speed is affecting the turbine. And based on all these inputs, we get some uh, rotor speed. And so if you're trying to capture a certain amount of rated power, generally the way you do it is you have a certain rated torque. That's a constant. So hold that to be constant. And you have a certain rated rotor speed. So you're trying to make that desired, that's your desired condition, so to speak. And so you measure the rotor speed that you actually have, compare it to your rated rotor speed, which is your desired reference. Based on that error, you change the blade pitch angle. And if you're able to do this perfectly, you'd have a constant rated torque, you'd have a constant rated rotor speed, and the product of those two would give you your rated power, which on an industrial scale turbine, it might be on the order of two and a half megawatts now for an onshore turbine, or five megawatts for, for an offshore turbine. Now, you can also think about this blade pitch angle. You know, if you just put your hand out, you're driving along in a car, you put your hand out of a window, you know by rotating your arm, you feel different forces. And that's essentially all this blade pitch angle is doing. By rotating the blade, you're reducing the forces on the blade. And by reducing the forces on the blade, you're reducing loads on the structure, both the tower and the blade. And you're also, so you're basically trying to shed power, so to speak. So that's how the control law works in region three. Um, and in here, they would generally do something like a PID law. So once I measure the error, the blade pitch angle might be related to the error by, by a PID sort of algorithm. There's lots of issues here as well um, in terms of uh, you're worried about exciting the tower for aft motions. You're also worried about drivetrain vibrations. In particular, drivetrain vibrations are pretty important because if you start adding more vibrations to the drivetrain, you can destroy the drivetrain, which is a pretty expensive replacement. And so there's lots of maybe more advanced things that people might do in addition to this kind of simple strategy that I've told you about. And then I guess I should also mention, I mentioned in the way I've been drawing things, if I just go back one slide, all my slides have just had a single blade pitch, meaning I control all three blades the same. People might call that collective blade pitch. But people are now starting to be more interested in having controlling all three blades individually. And so there might be, I might draw this as three different lines if I were to do this more accurately. And that individual pitch control, it allows you to take account of the fact that as the blades rotate, there are different gravitational forces and different aerodynamic forces. Certainly when the blade is passing in front of the tower, there's a, a lower aerodynamic force than when it's at the top. The wind speed generally grows the higher up you go from the ground. Okay, so the aerodynamic forces depend on where you're at sort of as you're rotating around. And so you can do better control if you control each of the three blades individually. All right, so now I just want to tell you a little bit about fault detection and diagnosis. I won't go into too much detail, but so I talked to you about control, but the other issue is how can I take measurements on the turbine, detect that something's gone wrong, or predict even better that something has gone wrong. And so the sort of things that can happen, here's sort of a gearbox, and this is just showing some chipping out of the teeth. And if you start getting small chips, then that can kind of you know, accelerate over time, and next thing you know, you've destroyed the whole gearbox. If you destroy the gearbox, You've got to basically take a crane to the site, and the, you could lose the turbine for a fair amount of time. And so if you could predict these failures in advance, you could maybe do preventative maintenance. I'm going to do my maintenance when I know there's going to be a low wind speed. And so that's a nice thing to do. Um, this is obviously a catastrophic failure, but you certainly have cases where you have blade failures. But there's also sort of large capacitors in, in these nacelles. And so this sort of case I've heard of, of, of uh, large capacitors catching fire, and then this is the sort of thing that happens. Okay, so that's just a little bit about fault detection. I just want to tell you just a little bit about some of the research that's going on here at the university, just to give you some ideas of uh, you know, where the research is going in this area. So one thing I already mentioned was this individual pitch control. The fact that you can control each of the blades individually means you can do a better job of um, controlling the structural loads, uh, capturing more power, and so on. And so I've given some papers here. but the control designs start getting a little bit more complicated than these sort of simple single input, single output control designs that we've been talking about up until now. Because now you've got multiple sort of control actions, many things that you might measure. So that's one idea. 
The other idea is this idea that I mentioned about sort of using preview control. So we talked about that there's a, typically an anemometer on the rear of the nacelle, and that's what's measuring wind speed, and it's measuring the wind direction. That's your main measurement for feedback. But it, those measurements aren't very good. And so, as I said, people are looking at putting a LIDAR that looks forward into the wind field. Here are a couple commercial scale LIDARs. And these LIDARs allow you to measure the wind before it hits the rotor plane. And so one thing you can think about doing is if you can sense that there's a large wind gust about to hit the rotor plane, then you can do something where you can pitch the blades in advance to sort of shed those loads. And so that's, that's, a, that's another idea that people are interested in. Um, I also mentioned now if you start doing in individual pitch control, what that means is you have multiple inputs and multiple outputs. And so all this diagram is showing here is there's um, various damage, sort of DEL here is a damage equivalent load. And so this plot is trying to compare, if I just do a simple PID law, for example, I just control all the blades um, together, versus I control all the blades individually using some state space methods, which might be a more advanced method, then I could look at what's the damage that I'm doing to the shaft, or what's the damage that I'm doing to the tower, either in side to side or fore aft. And so by that I mean if the wind is coming at me, side to side is in this direction, and fore aft is in this direction. And then I might also be worried about damage on the blade loads. And so these plots are they're normalized, but they're showing what the damage is for the PID relative to a more advanced state space method. And you can see the state space method is able to uh, reduce the loads in each case. And so people are interested in using these more advanced methods. I would say in industry, they maybe haven't had as sort of a as big of an impact as as they it, you know as big as an impact as you might expect, given that you can get these performance benefits. And that has to do with how long it takes to design these controllers. The fact that the controllers um, maybe need to be designed at different operating conditions and different wind speeds. The PID controllers are maybe a little bit simpler to design. All right, so I would say something else that's, that's maybe people are really interested in is farm level control. So everything that I've told you about up until now really has to do with controlling an individual turbine. But if you think about it, the, the farm itself is really what's generating the power. And so what happens is, imagine there's a wind speed coming in this direction. The first turbine is trying to maximize the power capture. That leaves a little bit less energy for the second turbine and down, on, down onto the chain. And so what happens is if each turbine is individually trying to maximize its own power, it actually leads to less power output overall for the wind farm. And so what you can imagine trying to do is, can I coordinate all of these turbines together in order to jointly maximize the power or jointly reduce structural loads be between all the turbines? And that's a pretty interesting idea. And so you can show on simple examples that it's possible. But I think the, the real trick is to show, does this actually work on a real turbine? Um, in order to do this, you need... You know, there are very complicated models that people have constructed for wind farms involving CFD and fluid structure inter interactions. As a control person, we need some sort of model to design uh, the controller. Um, and so there's this idea of, I need a very simple model to do the control design. What's a good simple model that tells me the effect of turbine one on the aerodynamic flow going into turbine two and so on? That's a, a research area. The other thing you could think about doing is I said, well, it would be really nice to have a better estimate of the wind speed at each turbine. And so people are looking at using LIDARs to measure the wind field. But LIDARs are very expensive. And so what would be really nice is the turbines themselves are somehow measuring the wind speed. If you see a turbine pitching its blade or changing its generator torque, that gives you some measurement of the wind flow. And so you can imagine treating all the turbines as somehow sensors that are they're distributed and you're tr somehow trying to estimate what the overall wind flow in the, in the wind farm is. And then you could use that estimate of the wind flow in place of a LIDAR or some other sensor to measure the wind speed. And so there are some interesting sort of distributed estimation problems here. Okay, so this may be the last one, but um, I talked a little bit about uh, fault detection. And so one thing that would be nice is to know something about the loads that you're putting on the blades. So if you're going to try and reduce the loads on the blades, if you can't measure what the loads are, you can only do so much. And so one issue is the blades themselves are extremely long. You know, they're on the order of 50 meters. And so it's very difficult to get power and, you know, put sensors out all along the blades, maintain them, get power to them, get the data off the sensors back to some central hub in the nacelle. And so one idea that's being looked at is um, 
the blades themselves vibrate, so they have certain vibrational energy, and you can capture that vibrational energy. And so there's a whole literature on developing energy harvesting uh, devices, devices that capture vibrational energy. And so if you, the, the basic idea here would be to couple an energy harvesting device to capture some of the vibrational energy in the blade, use that to power a sensor somewhere along the blade, and now you've got a way of, of uh, placing sensors anywhere on the blades that generate their own power. You don't have to worry about cabling or anything else that's going to and from the sensor. And so that would be a nice idea. All right, and so that's basically it. So just to wrap up, we gave you just a quick outline of what feedback control is, what it can do for you. I tried to give you some indication of how this is used currently on industrial scale wind turbines. And then I also gave you some sort of advanced sort of research areas that people are looking in. That's it. Question? Yep. No, I don't think it's it's not. Um, I would say people are using it. Um, how should I say this? Um, I think it more has to do with the complications with designing the algorithm. It's very easy. If I'm just going to do collective blade pitch control, I'm only at low wind speeds. I'm not going to use blade pitch control at all because at low wind speeds, I'm just trying to maximize power. At high wind speeds, I use blade pitch control. And in that regime, I'm going to hold the generator torque constant. And now I just have one input and one output. I move all three blades the same, and that has some effect on the rotor speed. And then I design a controller that measures rotor speed and decides how to change the blade pitch control. And so because it's one input, one output, it's very easy mentally to think about how do I change or tune my controller, controller in that sort of system? Once I'm controlling all three blades um, individually, certain things are happening that are time-bearing and periodic. So the forces that are on the blade are obviously dependent on the rotor speed. And so they're periodic with the, the period equal to one rotation period. And these controllers that are periodic and time-varying, I wouldn't say it's... Um, extremely challenging, but it's also not as easy to design as sort of a single input and single output. And so there has to be an economic case in terms of, is the, the benefit that I'm getting in terms of structural load reduction um, worth the extra design time that I need to design these controllers? That's the basic trade-off. Any other questions? Right. Yeah, so the question is, so I mentioned at low wind speeds, we call this region two, you try and maximize power. At high wind speeds, which I call region three, we try and do load reduction. And the question is about region 2.5, which is what happens when I go from, you know, one side of the region to the other side? I certainly don't want to be switching back and forth between two controllers. And so how do I blend or move smoothly between these two regions? That's what people might call region two and a half. And so... If you look in sort of the academic literature, there's very little written that describes how you do this transition from region two and a half to region three. And for companies, this is really kind of where their art comes in. I think most people in region two, if you look at what companies are doing, they're using this standard control law. And in region three, you do something also very classical. And so when you transition between these two regions, that's really where you can get large loads because if you don't move smoothly between the two controllers, you can generate extremely large loads on the blades in the tower. And so the real sort of proprietary part of the design for most of these companies is how they do this blending uh, between the two regions. And so um, what was your specific question? How do people do this? Right, so it wouldn't be done in a way where if you're trying to do individual pitch control, each blade pitch is in a different region. They would at least all be simultaneously doing one controller or the other. 
And so the very basic way of doing this, which would maybe not be the best thing, is you can do something where you can do a hard switch, where if you cross over a certain wind speed, you're in this region, and then you have to go down to a lower wind speed before you cross over into this region. It, but you might do it based on averaging wind for a certain amount of time, so you're not constantly transitioning between the two controllers. And then once you make the decision to switch from one controller to another, then you've got to do some blending to, to sort of seamlessly transition between uh, one controller or another. So, I mean, there are many ways of doing this sort of like bumpless transfer to, to seamlessly transition between one controller and another. But the main issue is you don't really want to be doing this switch very often if you can help it. And so you might want to just do some wind speed averaging and just do it every once in a while. <laughs>